They're a bit like face huggers, aren't they? Face huggers? No, you know, Alien. The horror movie Alien. There's a horror movie called Alien. That's really offensive. No wonder everyone keeps invading you. Scanning for audio. So, welcome to a Tin Dog Podcast, talking about last Christmas, and unlike every other podcast in the world, I will not be using the Wham track. Oh no, not I. Yes, I know you received a Tin Dog Podcast release this morning, Christmas Day, being, well, my Christmas special. But now, well, you and I have seen last Christmas, and I thought, well, let's have another podcast. If you count the Hoostrology, that's three in one day. Yes, I'm spoiling you. But anyway, it is Christmas, isn't it? Isn't it? So, Santa Claus 100% exists in our family, in our house, and in this podcast. But I'm here to review Doctor Who, and that's a totally different kettle of fish. Except it's, well, Doctor Who on Christmas Day. Now that is a thankless task. Riding Doctor Who to go out on Christmas Day has always been difficult at best. And the problem for Stephen Moffat is he's, well, he's already peaked. He's already given us a Christmas carol, which is spectacularly good. And with this one, one can be forgiven for believing that we've already seen this. That's, I think, the best way of putting it. Yes, in Amy's choice, the Sound of Bird song signified a switch in realities, from one dreamscape to another dreamscape, where a decision had to be made in order to try and escape with their lives. Yeah, you get it. It's the same basic idea. But it's not. You've got to have Santa at Christmas, haven't you? Well, at least this was a lot more Christmassy than last year's Regeneration special. It felt better. It felt more family-friendly. Except, I didn't really enjoy it. I'm just going to be a Christmas curmudgeon. I know people will be adoring this. And I'm not for one second joining the Moffat must go or anything like that. Again, it just wasn't for me. Is that a crime? I'm just too old school, too not the target audience, really. Well, it did have one big surprise for me. One massive moment where I went, oh. And that was that, I don't want to jump to the end, but Clara's staying. That press report of her leaving at the end was wrong. It was twisted. It was a surprise. It was the ultimate twist for me. I thought Clara was done, gone, finished, written off, out of the way. Thank you very much. We have dealt with your story arc. Let's move along now. But no, I don't know how long she'll stay in the next series, but she might actually stay for the whole series. And that gets my vote. As long as we can get rid of more Danny Pink. Yes, the taste, the aftertaste of Danny Pink's death, which was only admittedly, what, six weeks ago, is still bitter. And he's here, again, rubbing it in, the fact that he died to save Clara and perhaps the rest of the world as collateral damage. But let's look at the actual story, not just the manufactured arguments about characterization, which is similar to Amy's choice. Because, let's face it, modern drama isn't about the big sci-fi ideas, because the big sci-fi ideas here all come from 1950s sci-fi. But there's a reason. 
Now, Doctor Who has pillaged other bits of literature. It has a long and noble tradition of mm, homaging, which is a posh way of saying ripping off other storylines. We've had it since the year dot, and I'm not going to apologise to anyone for this. Two of my all-time favourite films are The Thing from Outer Space, which I believe is 1956, which is a vampire carrot from beyond space, which was remade later on by John Carpenter as The Thing, which is indeed a fantastic film, but it's not the same and not the original. I love, adore, worship 1950s American B-movie sci-fi, and The Thing from Another Planet, if you want to be specific, is not a B-movie, it's an A-movie, because it's got particularly high production values, very good casting, very good acting, and very good writing. Uh, BBC Three have missed a massive trick by not showing this film uh, immediately afterwards, because it's the sort of thing that could be shown in the afternoon, because it is tame by modern film standards. Now, the glorious thing with this is, and I will get back to the characterization in a moment, is that the Geordie shop girl and sci-fi fan not only references these films in her big list of things to read, yes, she will do a Game of Thrones marathon and more about Game of Thrones towards the end of this podcast, but she, in many respects, if she is going to watch those films while she has the dream face hugger on her face, yes, we'll get back to that one in a moment. Well, that, for me, means that she's responsible for the entire dreamscape that everything else exists inside of. So yes, we had Michael Troughton, which I want to talk about in a moment. We had Geordie Girl, and yes, I will really need to deal with that in a moment. And of course we had Edie McGreedy from Balamori. I believe it was Edie McGreedy. I could be wrong. No, nope, I think I'm right. So, let's break it down. We've got Dreamscape. The whole thing, dream within dream within dream. We've got psychic links. We've got the Doctor having to come back to, for Clara, possibly because her contract said, right, we've dealt with that emotional story. Arc. Let's go back and we'll have to deal with the lies and the retribution. Unlike real life, you do have to like deal with these things. You can't just move along for the rest of your lives thinking that the other person's got along nicely. Yes, the reasonably nice twist with aged Clara works. And on paper, these things are great. But I still left feeling not as served as I could have been, but I'm just a watcher of a TV show. I would hate to have gone through the whole of Christmas Day building up to this and then having to get to it. Nick Frost's performance exemplary. I do feel from the bottom of my heart that Michael Troughton was wasted in this. In comparison to the role his brother David did in Midnight, these guys are phenomenally good actors and the most exciting thing he got to do in this was eat a chicken and then vanish a bit of a waste yes but no more of a waste than well the elves starkey as an elf hilarious yes his comedy timing indeed exemplary it was love to see him without his makeup but still felt empty wasted not used to the fullest and perhaps that's good leave the audience wanting more. Yes, I wanted more from these people. Yes, the Doctor having to deal with Santa. Yes, that's fine. Yes, the dream within a dream. Fair enough, I get it. And if you sat down and compared this storyline with Amy's Choice, at least the aliens in this were actually alien. It works for me. So, let's deal with our, our usual suspects of people. Michael Troughton, I've covered. Bit of a waste. Fantastic actor. Nicely portrayal. Works. Edie McCready, nice that she was in a wheelchair. Not exactly obvious, but if I'd given any thought to this, you could have said, yeah, she's going to be somebody different when she wakes up. That's fine. And of course, Geordie Girl, the one who dances. The one who comes across as a bit thick. The one who is, let's face it, if you think Clara's leaving, the potential new sidekick because she could get away with saying what's going on. She would make a decent character. Now, there's a whole class war thread on Big Finish as to whether it has to be middle class or working class or upper class for a companion truly to work, hence the getting rid of Flip in the current Colin Baker series. But that's for another set of reviews, not this one. No. Do working class characters work in Doctor Who? That's an entirely new podcast, and I'd like to discuss that with a different podcaster, with a, perhaps a different take on class structure than my slightly left-wing views. So, 
Does she work well? As you all know, I have issues with Geordie's travelling through time. So I was wondering whether she'd be any good as a companion. But that's because I bought into the whole idea that she would be the new companion. I don't know. You see, does the Geordie accent travel well? I don't know. The Americans rejected Cheryl Cole at the border. Has that taught us nothing? Yes, they're having trouble with, well, the new Doctor's accent. Give them a Geordie accent to deal with. I'd love to hear some of the reviews on that one. The entire world going, sorry, I really do have to watch this programme with subtitles. So yeah, does the accent travel? I just don't know. I'm not brave enough to look that one up. So, Clara, the ageing makeup. Oh, Moffat, please stop putting people into old age makeup. And then having the doctor look at her with loving eyes and not seeing any difference. Ah, shut up and move along. Yes, I am a grump. Bar humbug, it's Christmas. I left this story feeling hollow, and now that I review it, I don't know why. Because on paper, it just works. Perhaps the bar really has been set far, far too high by the wonderment that is A Christmas Carol. But I know that if I listened to my review of Christmas Carol, all I'd probably talk about is the ridiculousness of the sharks. And not Jeff, who the Doctor knows really is Santa Claus. And that, really, is that not at the heart of this story? Santa's in it, but Santa's not real here. It's a fine line you must tread, Mr Moffat, in this storytelling, and perhaps you'll get some reviews that don't look on it as kindly. Perhaps people will love this. I just don't know. And so, yes, the aliens may look and behave like facehuggers, but facehuggers of a dream. And how they invaded Earth. Yes, there are loopholes. Why there's so few of them on Earth and all that nonsense. But... Let's just forget it, and the next time you have an ice cream headache at one side of the head, just think, am I awake, or am I asleep, or am I dreaming? One moment that I did like was the It's a Long Story, together with, of course, the reading of the manuals. Because It's a Long Story could just be explained or swapped with, I'll explain later, for any Doctor Who fans. And for me, that worked really well. You see, there are some superb and stunning moments. But like I said, Christmas special... It's a thankless task. You can't please the fans and the general public at the same time. But perhaps with this one, I think he managed it. Perhaps. So, after this bumper day of Tin Dog Podcast, I just want to say Merry Christmas to you all, and to you all be seeing you. After the end credits, you'll hear a recording I made from Mastermind. That's the BBC's quiz programme. Somebody's specialist subject was Doctor Who. I present for you the round. See how many questions you know the answers to. I suspect, dear listener, it's all of them. But for that, well, I'll let you listen. You've been listening to the Tin Dog Podcast. Available on RSS, iTunes, Stitcher, Audio Boom, and Tumblr. Doctor Who and its associated works are copyright of the BBC. No infringement is intended. You can contact the show, donate, buy merchandise, or find out more about my other projects by visiting the Tin Dog Podcast homepage and clicking on the links. The Tin Dog Podcast is a founder member of the Doctor Who Podcast Alliance. And your name is? Katie Bateman. Your occupation? I'm a housewife. And your chosen subject? Doctor Who, 2005 to the present day. Doctor Who, in two minutes. In the episode Cold War, which aliens return after an absence of almost 40 years, they were last seen in the monster of Peladon in 1974. The Ice Warriors. Yes, who played the War Doctor in the 50th anniversary episode The Day of the Doctor in November 2013? He first appeared in the episode The Name of the Doctor. John Hurt. Yep, in which episode do the winged statues, the weeping angels, first appear? They feed on their victims' potential time energy. Blink. Yep. Whom does the Doctor describe as a ghastly old goat while he and Amy are watching Van Gogh painting in Vincent and the Doctor? Picasso? Yes. In The Big Bang, the Dalek tells River Song that her records indicate she will show a particular quality because she's an associate of the Doctor. What quality? 
Mercy. Yep. The writer Mark Gatiss appears as a chess-playing space Viking in The Wedding of River Song, credited under the alias Rondo Haxton. What is the character's name? Gantok. Yes, in The Parting of the Ways, how does the Doctor draw out the time vortex energy from Rose into himself? He kisses her. He does. Who is Donna about to marry at the beginning of The Runaway Bride when she is transported up to the TARDIS? Lance. Yes, in the episode Blink, the Doctor says, people assume that time is a strict progression of cause to effect. But actually, from a non-linear, non-subjective viewpoint, it's more like a big ball of wibbly-wobbly what? Timey-wimey stuff. Yes, in the end of Time Part 2, Bernard Cribbins makes his last appearance as the grandfather of Donna Noble. What is his character's name? Wilfred Mott. Yes, the empty child begins with the TARDIS responding to a distress call. What colour is this universally recognised signal for danger? Mauve. Yep, in the episode New Earth, Cassandra tells the Doctor that she will leave the body of Rose when she finds one that is younger and... Pass. Sarah Jane and which other former companion are reunited with the Doctor after many years in the episode School Reunion? K-9. Yes, in the end of time part one, what does the Master bang to attract the Doctor to the derelict site near the docks? An oil drum. Yes. What rank is Father Octavian, who leads a party of 20 clerics in pursuit of a weeping angel, on Alfalva Metraxis in the episode The Time of Angels? Bishop? Yes, Bishop Second Class, as it happens. You had just the one past Katie. Cassandra told the doctor she'd leave the body of Rose when she finds someone younger and less common. Which you knew, didn't you? Mm. Yeah, absolutely. But, come on, 14 points. Oh, oh thank you.